All right, welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. How does my audio sound, Jared? Sounds good. Did you remember to turn my microphone on? Yep. Oh, that's good. That's always a good way to start the show is with a live microphone. At least I've found that in my vast uh, Like one that walks experience. and talks and stuff like that? Really? A live microphone? How about a hot mic? A hot mic. Hot works. mic. Hot mic. Just don't touch it. Yeah, you got to be careful every once in a while when you're on a set. Uh, people will put lavalier mics on and, and they'll walk around and forget that they're turned on. Which is nice sometimes. And, the, and then say things that they didn't want other people to hear. Hmm. But that wasn't me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Student of the Gun Radio. As I said, I am the, I am Paul Markle. I am your host. And I am in the glass case of Emotion Studios located at Student of the Gun University. And you should come down and join us sometime. We have classes. Jared, when's our next class? When's the next Beyond the Band-Aid class? August 29th and 30th. August 29th and 30th. So get on it. Uh, and then we have another one scheduled. We have an open uh, an open schedule, an open casting call for students in Marquette, Michigan. Yep, Marquette, Michigan. Here's what you guys want to do. Listen up. Go to SOTGU. It's kind of short for Student of the Gun University because we know you guys don't like to type all those big words. So Jared made it short. Go to SOTGU.com, click on the live training events, and reserve yourself a seat in one of our upcoming training events. You will not regret it. But you may regret it if you don't, conversely. we got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Uh, it is Wednesday, and because it is Wednesday, that means it is our SWAT Fuel Fitness Talk Day, and we know that you guys look forward to that each and every week. And if you're new... If this is your first Wednesday with Student of the Gun Radio, congratulations. Hold on to your seat. Cause Carol, you're... you better be listening. That's right. Carol, you better be listening. Uh, if she's not, I'm going to be really disappointed. Uh, anything we want to talk about before you get into it? You've got your topic pick there, I see. Yeah, I've got my topic pick. You've got your I, topic. I had to put some notes in this one because it's, uh, it's going to be kind of short and to the point, but it's uh, a lot to talk about, if that, if that makes sense. Okay. you got a lot of points you want to cover. A lot of points that I want to cover. Oh, before we uh, we get into points that we're covering, uh, this weekend, we talked about it this week, uh, <laughs> the Duracoat project that we've got going on, it is ongoing. As a matter of fact, as we're recording this, the Fury 12-gauge shotgun from Century is currently in the drying stage. It has the third coat on it. Uh, if you, anybody who's done a Duracoat camouflage pattern knows exactly how that stuff goes. It's uh, actually tumbling in the dryer right yeah, it's, now. It's tumbling. In the, no, we don't do that because we're not stupid. But uh, it is drying right now, so by this weekend, by next week, we'll have pictures for you of the uh, of the project. Uh, right now, if you go to uh, Student of the Guns Facebook or our Instagram, we have a picture of the Mossberg Cruiser that I did in slightly darker black. And that's it. It's just slightly darker black. And somebody, one of you guys out there said, well, I want to see a before picture. You want to see a before picture? Go to Mossberg's website and go to the Model 500 with black synthetic furniture. And that's what it looked like. It was a super generic, basic Model 500. That was it. And uh, now it has a, a chote folding stock on it. And it has a, a Van Comp extra large thumb safety uh and it has, well, obviously Duracoat. It has a Duracoat slightly darker black finish on it. Now, I didn't do the choke stock. I just did the receiver, the barrel, and the magazine tube and the magazine tube cap. But check it out. It's there. Uh, don't forget about our friends at Gun District. Gundistrict.com is the gun-friendly social media site. So uh, if, if you are an anti-Facebook and an anti-Twitter person, that's cool because we are too. Go over to gundistrict.com and uh, sign up, search your own page, and please, if you're following us, or if you're not following us, follow us on the official Student of the Gun page and give us a like or a thumbs up or a, a star or a whatever you do. How's that sound? All of those. Give all, us of those. all of do those. Do all of those things. High five. Give us a high five, five, thumbs up, yeah, yeah, all that stuff. So we talked about our friends at, at, at uh, Century Arms. Once we get, and here's the deal, when you do a Duracoat project, and I'm going to warn you, you need to do it and then leave the gun alone. I know that's really hard for a lot of people because like, no, 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 I'm excited. I want to take it out and shoot it. And do. No, you need to let it cure. I, you're like, oh, I touched it with my fingers and it's dry. Ah, 
I get that. It's dry, but you need to let that hardener cure. If you send a gun away to a finisher, and they, they'll give it back to you, and there's usually a note in there that says, look, do not you, you know, use hard use or apply hard use to this for two weeks because if you don't, you'll ruin the finish. Now, there are some that you can bake. Uh, we don't bake our stuff. We just air dry it. But uh, once we, uh, a couple of weeks have gone by, we'll go ahead and we'll get back out to the range and we'll be blasting with that Fury shotgun again. Uh, and that's from Century Arms. Uh, also, before we jump into the SWAT fuel uh, dealio, I want you guys to uh, remember Crossbreed Holsters. Crossbreed Holsters is coming up on their 10th anniversary. And... Uh, so, I think they're going to do like or a is special... Is it 10th anniversary of Crossbreed or 10th anniversary of, of Mark's show? Because he said he was... He told us, he said, I'm going to the cross to Republic, Missouri to Crossbreed for the special 10th anniversary celebration. So I don't know if he meant was it, it was Crossbreed's 10th anniversary or if it was... That must be it. That's, that sounds about right. Because mm. it's 2015 now. So, I have a direct line that I can ask. You do have a direct line. All right. So check those guys out. If you're not carrying a gun, you're wrong. Fix yourself. Uh, I'm actually carrying a Century Arms TB9 SA in my crossbreed. In a crossbreed holster. OWB. Yep. OWB. And I'm wearing a, a Super Tuck right now. Uh, crossbreedholsters.com. That is the website you want to go to. All right, Jared. I'm going to shut my mouth, and I'm going to let you uh, bump us in with the SWAT Fuel Fitness Talk. I'm not quite sure what's going on over there. Usually you're dancing, but you were shaking your head. You must have been looking at some news. I'm reading a story that's making me not a happy camper. But you go ahead and do yeah, happy let's, stuff. Let's talk about positivity since it's not making you a happy camper. Uh, a lot of you guys out there, when you work out or when you mull through your daily life, you probably have things that set you back, and I want you to overcome those by being positive, focusing on what works for you. Uh, instead of getting discouraged, don't get discouraged. If you, if you come to a spot, especially when you're working out, don't get discouraged when you come to a plateau. You need to change, make a change in your workout, and change and focus on what works for you. And obviously that's going to take some trial and error but it's worth the effort and the time. So positivity, change through focusing on what works. Uh, and don't get discouraged. I know that's sometimes hard to do, but I'm here for you. Uh, and another point that I want to make today is where is your passion? Is your passion in preparing yourself or is your passion in playing? There's a difference. And my passion is in preparing. I like to play, but... You need to focus your passion on, like say if you're preparing, like working out, prepare yourself. Put your passion in the preparing stage rather than playing. Good thing we have pop filters because you're, you're peeing it up over there. It's my nose. No, you, you said passion, preparing, and playing all in the same sentence. Oh, did I really? Yeah. Prepared, passion, and playing. Oh, pop, 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 I pop. think my peas are a little bit more p today because <laughs> the, the nose, but it's getting better, so... Uh, where is your passion? That's my question to you. And you guys that are in the grad program, you can answer me on the grad program Facebook page. Uh, but it, your passion really needs to be in the preparing stage. And your, I'm going to go back to what I talked about the very first episode of the fitness talk again, and that's setting your goals. What is your end goal? Is your is your passion to prepare fueling your you for your to reach your end goal yes or no and your end goal should always be in the front of your mind uh, the more you think about your end goal the easier it is to uh, make the right commitments or change your commitments to actually reach that goal and that's that's pretty much it positivity change through focusing on what works make your passion to prepare instead of play and then keep your end goal in the front of your mind. What do you think? What do I think? I think that I'm going to write defend the faith, and then I'm going to hit send. 
But uh, no, it's funny that you mentioned that, Jared. You and I talked about this, and I don't, we probably mentioned it even on the radio. But uh, that show, uh, Eastbound and Down, uh, with uh, Danny Danny McBride on H is it HBO? Yeah, Eastbound and Down. Anyway, sure. In, in the first season, I don't know if it's episode one or two or what have you, uh, but <laughs> he goes to. You know, he's a retired ba- or uh, an out of work baseball player, professional baseball player that returns to his hometown, and he's kind of like the guy who was the hero, and now he's the has been, uh, but he still thinks he's the hero. Well, he, he goes to the school, this school where his his high school sweetheart works, and he runs into her new boyfriend, who's also the principal, and the new boyfriend is trying to impress him about telling how he's he's like he's working out, he's going to do a a triathlon or something like that and Danny McBride looks at him and he goes I'm a professional athlete I'm not trying to be the best at exercising yeah that's funny and you know it's 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 funny and it's you know it's a joke and it's a TV show but the fact is is we have people in America that have totally lost the we, we've lost purpose we've lost <laughs> the concept of why you you exercise why you do PT physical training right when when and I like to use this Marine Corps thing. But when I was in the Marine Corps, we didn't PT. We didn't do physical training so that we could be that we could compete in physical training competitions. We trained to prepare our bodies to perform a task and to do a job. You, you know, professional athletes, football players, baseball players, whatever, they don't go and do push-ups, sit-ups, squats, and, and all that stuff. They don't hit the gym. They don't run. They don't, they don't do that so they can participate in exercising. They do that to train their bodies for a mission. And I guess what Jared is saying and what I would say to you is, do you have a goal and do you have a mission or are you just playing around? You know, what is, what is your purpose uh, is your purpose just to like be a better exerciser than other people, or do you have a mission in mind? Do you have a purpose in mind? So uh, that, that's what I would say. And be, and the reason that I mention I throw this out is, you know, exercising can get tedious. Physical exercise can get tedious. Physical training can get tedious. After you you know you get really super excited, and then two weeks into it, a month into it, or you know a month or more into it, you're like not as excited anymore. You're like I'm tired of doing these exercises. I've done a lot of them, and I don't want to do them anymore. Well, that's why you need to have what, Jared? A goal. You need to have a stated purpose and a mission in mind so that when you are frustrated and you are bored, you say, well, I'm not doing this so I can be the best at doing push-ups. I'm doing this so I can increase my strength so I can achieve my goal, whatever that goal happens to be. So. And tell your friends your goals. Put, yeah. Make your goals public because then you have it, – it's something that uh, makes you feel accountable to actually achieve your goal because there's this thing called disappointment. And people don't like to feel disappointment by letting down their friends or their family or whoever's closest to you. Tell them your goal. There you go. Well, very cool. All right, that and does that wrap up our SWAT Fuel Fitness Talk for the week? Yeah, that wraps it up. All right, and make sure when you guys go to, to SWATFuel.com that you use the promo code SOTG2015 when you place your order because you're going to save yourself 10% off of the total cost. Oh, if you guys have specific fitness-related questions, uh, email them to me. I've set up an, an email address specifically for the fitness stuff, and I can answer that on the Wednesday shows. It's PT as in physical training or physical trainer, P-T-J-A-R-R-A-D, at gmail.com. G. Real simple. G. Gmail. G. G. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if SWAT Fuel is available at Brownells yet. It's available uh. lots of places. Dan actually was, uh, I think he was getting it on Amazon. I have, to, I have to check and see if it's on Amazon. But uh, Brownells, while they might not have SWAT Fuel, they pretty much have everything else. They've got Duracoat. They have Frog Lube. Uh, you can order Frog Lube from them, or you can order it from Brownells. Uh, and they have a new product section. If you're not checking them out or on a regular basis, you want to do that because uh, they're all the time adding new products to the uh, the catalog. And they've got thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of products right now. Uh, but, yeah, do yourself a favor. And you know what? You might be like me. 
you might go to brownells.com and hit the new products category and realize that there's something that exists that you didn't know was there and now you need that thing kind of like the ammo block do you really need it kind of like the ammo block yeah Uh, that is a pretty cool concept though yeah it is a pretty cool concept and i think we should get some more of them and stack them up like giant legos all right. Hey, guess what? We've got some good news for you. We have a go team moment. We haven't had one of these in a while, but this was shared with one of our, uh, by, with us by one of our grad program members. And so we're going to go ahead and talk about this. It's, it's creepy and it's sick, but it ended well, at least for the intended victim. Oh, speaking of grad program members, I just want to let you guys know that for all of you that went to the grad program Facebook page that you actually like, that is not the correct one. Did you know that? Mm. There's a there's a page like a, a like our student of the gun page. Yeah, that's not the right one. It's the the one the correct one is an actual like a secret group that you guys can't get to. So oh, you have to I just be want to let you know. to it. Yeah, because it's I, an I, invite only thing. Yeah, well, I told them that if they went there, they would be able to see the the giveaway details. And so a bunch of people went and liked the other page, but that's not the correct one. So I want to let you know that. So you didn't think we were lying. That's why I say wow. <laughs> I, I just, I was just a browsing and I saw another go team moment that we're going to have to talk about tomorrow, but we're not going to talk about it today. Uh, this one right here came to us from West Virginia, and it, it's freaking sick. A, a woman was the victim of what we're finding out was a, a potential serial killer, and he was going to be her latest murder victim until she decided to fight back. Jared's got the audio from the uh, the story. It's a CNN.com audio, and we would have used the other audio from West Virginia, but it was crappy audio, and you guys in West Virginia need to fix yourselves. So we're going to use the Communist News Network audio, and then I'm going to talk about it. Virginia, to believe Falls may be a serial I knew he was there to kill me. I could tell that he had already done something because he said that he was in, going to prison for a long time. After meeting a stranger that answered her escort ad on Backpage.com, a West Virginia woman known only as Heather says the man became aggressive, wrapping his hands around her throat. He was saying, you're going to be quiet. I'm going to say, call the orders. Moments later, she was running from her Charleston home, pleading for help and chasing down a neighbor who called 911. There's a lady in the uh, alley here. She's saying that uh, some guy tried to rape her and she had to send herself. <laughs> She's got cuts and stuff all over. When he strangled me, um, he just wouldn't let me get any air. And so I grabbed my rake. And when he laid the gun down to get the rake out of my hands, I, I shot him. I just grabbed the gun and shot behind me. Heather shot and killed Neil Falls, the 45-year-old now under the microscope, as a kill kit discovered inside his Subaru has led investigators in West Virginia to believe Falls may be a serial killer. Items inside included a machete, axes, knives, a shovel, a large container of bleach, and trash bags. That's really sick and disturbing and twisted. And a lot of you out there probably holding your nose as you're like, this woman was a what? She she was an escort? Well, okay, I mean, she's an escort, but does she deserve to be murdered and dismembered? I don't think so. Uh, this woman, she had, talk about a once, a, a, the million dollar shot. She snatched up the gun pointed it at the dude over her shoulder toward the rear and pulled the trigger. And uh, God wanted this guy to die. He wanted him to not be here anymore. But uh, the reason I wanted to share this with you is not so much about the specific incident. It's not so much about the salacious details of the potential serial killer. It's because a police detective, when he gave an interview to the local news, said the following. And this is what really, this is the nut. This is the nugget that I want you to take away from this. I believe that Heather saved lives and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to bring some closure to some other families too. If she hadn't fought back, she would most certainly be dead. That right there, if she had not fought back, she would most certainly be dead think about that 
How many times have you heard security experts and law enforcement experts tell you or write, you know, they, they hand out these pamphlets or they put up posters or they give the advice in person? If you're ever confronted by a violent criminal, don't fight back. Just give them what they want. Try to be a good witness. Uh, in the story there, it said that the, when they found this dude's dead body, that he had four sets of handcuffs in his pockets. He was going to murder this woman. He was going to do horrible things to her and murder her. And if she would have taken the advice of the security experts and the law enforcement experts and the, uh, I don't know, I guess, you know, what does Shannon want you to do? What is, what is Nanny Bloomberg and Shannon and their ilk, what, what do they want people to do when confronted with, with psychotic murderers and vermin and felons? Do they want you to just be a good witness? That works out really great right up until the time that the uh, monster decides that there aren't going to be any witnesses, that they're going to kill you. Oh, uh, yeah, so what's your plan then? By the time you decide, you realize, oh, this like surrendering and being cooperative and being a good witness isn't going to work out for me. By the time you realize that, it's too late to fight back. So when do you want to fight back? Now, immediately at the very beginning. The moment, the millisecond that you realize that the person confronting you is a bad person, is intending to harm you, the moment, not, well, I'll give them a second chance, a third chance, fourth, no. The moment that you realize in your head, in your mind, this person's going to hurt me. This person's going to do bad things to me. This person is going to rob me. This person is going to do whatever. The moment you realize that, start fighting back right then. They don't get second chances. They want a second chance? Don't confront me. Don't come to where I am and bring your crap to me. Don't bring it to my door. They're like, well, what about the response? It's like, no, you are responsible for keeping you alive. And and this woman in West Virginia, uh, she did the whole nation a favor by putting one through this guy's cranium. Now we're going to go ahead and, and uh, turn him into fertilizer, and we can all move on with our lives. But what if she would have taken the advice of the Nanny Bloombergs and the Shannons and the, and the security experts and just surrendered? Then she'd she would be dead, be, and this guy would be moving on to the next person. She would be in a plastic bag right now. That's right. So uh, don't ever forget that. That's that is what I wanted to drive home with that particular story. Is uh, can you play that one more time so that everybody remembers it? Play the detective's audio one the detective's more audio. time. Yeah, I'll have to bring it up though. Oh, okay. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to mess you up there, uh, studio engineer, producer no, guy. Right. This this uh, freaking West Virginia Fox website is like I don't even know how terrible. To yeah, it's. It's insane. Dude, I can tell, build better. We do audio for a living, and when somebody, when when a professional news company, we were going to play audio last week from Ohio. What is it about the Northwest there, um, or the Midwest? Oh, uh, the Midwest, where yeah, the the news company in Ohio, they couldn't do it. All right, play this one more time, and I want you guys to let this audio burn into your brains. I believe that Heather saved lives and. Uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to, to bring some closure to some other families, too. If she hadn't fought back, she would most certainly be dead. If she hadn't fought back, she would most certainly be dead. Tell your wives, tell your daughters, tell your nieces, tell the people that you care about. Look, don't, don't surrender. Fight back with everything you have in you. All right? All right, moving on. Wow, we're already 24 minutes into this. What happened? We did our fitness talk. And I'm actually pretty we excited. We wrapped a little bit. I'm excited for the second part Okay. because I don't know what you're going to say. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I know what I'm going to say. It's a good thing. Here's what I'm going to say. You got a black rifle? You know what, Jared? I forgot that I had one more. I have a velocity trigger that I have not installed in a gun yet. Are you going to install it or give it away? 
No, I'm gonna. We just gave one away. I've, I'm gonna put it in that new pistol. I've got a, an AR-15 oh. pistol with a wrist stabilizer, and yes, I'm doing air quotes in the glass case of motion. The that AR-15 pistol with a wrist stabilizer, uh, and it has the standard uh, generic trigger in it. I think I might drop that velocity trigger in there. And you know why I can do that? Because it's ridiculously it's ridiculously easy to do that you can do it at your kitchen table you can do it uh at your workbench look dudes can you follow directions because if you can follow directions you're good to go if you're honest with yourself and you're like i just can't follow directions (laughs) then have a gunsmith do it but i guarantee you it's not that hard Uh, velocity triggers it's a one-piece kit uh, just check them out at velocitytriggers.com, and you won't be uh, you won't be disappointed. All right, the uh, title for today. First of all, I'm going to go ahead and rather than make it up, I'm going to give you the the internet's definition of what a paper tiger is. I typed in the word paper tiger into my search engine. First thing, a person or thing that appears threatening but is ineffectual. That's funny that they use the word ineffectual because I used that in conversation once and the person told me that I was just making up words to try and seem smart. And I said, no, that that actually is a real word. I don't think that's a real word. I think you're just making that up. Like, I've never heard of paper tiger used before, but I kind of figured out what No, it was. I wasn't talking about paper tiger. I was talking about the word ineffectual. Oh, ineffectual. Yeah. Okay. I used the word ineffectual in a sentence and, and somebody told me, that I was just making up words to try and seem smarter. Wow. <laughs> like, uh, okay. No, paper tiger, a person or thing that appears threatening or is ineffectual. Now, Fort Hood, part one. You guys all remember Major Nidal Hassan, uh, jihadist, Muhammad Durka Durka. You know what? While I'm talking, go ahead, and we need to give him an, an honorary uh, goat rapist update thing. But you guys remember Fort Hood Part 1 and how a, a Muslim, a devout Muslim, who was down with the struggle, down with the jihad, down with the extremism. Uh, the U.S. Army knew that this guy was a rotten apple. They knew he was a piece of crap. They knew he was not part of the team. But because in our modern era, we can't point that out. We can't, like, say that out loud because <clears throat> the commander-in-chief is 100% down with the goat rapists. He's down with the brotherhood struggle. So if you're in the army and you boot somebody out and they're part of the, the death cult of Islam, well, then, oh, you might have to answer to someone. So what does the army do? Instead of getting rid of this turd, they just keep shifting him around. How many places you work with where they're like, man, we got this guy who works at our place. He's a piece of crap. And they won't get rid of him. They just ship him from department to department. They make him a plague on the whole company. You got it. Let's go ahead. In in honor of Major Nidal Hassan Skyhook, we're going to go ahead and play this. Das geht an die Oma. Wir sind die Oma. Check das out. Bismillah. Yeah, we love it. Mixmaster Jazzy Jared over there. Mixing it up for us. Thanks, Kurt. That's never going to go away now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to find a place to put my sticker, but it's too big. It won't fit on my soundboard. Um, it won't fit it's on. It's got to be someplace you can stick it. I, it's sitting right here. It says Jazzy Jared. DJ Jazzy Jared, the Mixmaster. So Fort Hood Part 1 goes down. We have a jihadist who walks around murdering innocent soldiers, soldiers who are in a, uh, a communal area. What was it, the, the pre-deployment area or whatever? It doesn't matter. And what does the Army do? Well, first the Army freaks, and they decide to crack down on soldiers owning you know, private possession of weapons in the Army. Does okay, that makes sense? Yeah, because that's a good job. Let's not go ahead and address the actual problem which is political correctness and fear of being called a racist kept this guy around when he should have been gone. So that's part one. Part two, we have an administration from top to bottom, and then we have a willing media that will not call this what it is. 
they would not call this an act of terrorism, of Muslim death cult terrorism committed in the United States of America. That's a workplace violence. Horse crap. You know it. I know it. We all know it. But we're living in this weird upside down world where we can't speak the truth. We talked about this before, but I'm going to mention it again. I do that. I know. But it's worth mentioning. After Fort Hood Part 1 went down, you know, my, my family members, my acquaintances and friends who are not in the military or not involved with the military at all. I'm, if you're in the Army, Air Force, National Guard, Marines, whatever, and your family members aren't, you become the spokesman for the military in your family or in your group, right? Uh, kind of like being the only gun owner in your family and every time someone has a question, they, they go to you. So, yeah, my family members and, and acquaintances and friends they're like, I don't understand how could this could happen. How could a guy walk around just indiscriminately murdering people without anyone fighting back, without, without being shot? Why did contract security officers, not military troopers, not soldiers, why is it that contract security officers had to be the one to engage and shoot this piece of crap? And, yeah, he's still sucking up oxygen off of planet Earth. Sucking up the good oxygen from you and I. Why is that? And they they were dumbfounded. They're like, I don't understand how this could happen. I mean, they're soldiers. Don't soldiers have guns? I mean, doesn't the army, people in the army, they have guns? There was this assumption by the American public at large that if you're, I mean, we're already into the global war on terror. That Fort Hood Part 1 didn't happen pre-9-11. It happened years after, years and years after 9-11. So you'd have thought we'd have got the memo after we were attacked, after we finally, after decades of having uh, the death cult of Islam being at war with us, we finally got the memo. We're like, wow, maybe, maybe we should be at war with them. And then we still didn't get it. Then we, you know, I don't hate George Bush. I don't dislike George H. W. or George W. Bush, but when he said the uh, religion of peace, that was probably the stupidest. You know, you're like, oh, George Bush said a lot of dumb stuff. Yeah, he really a lot of the stuff that George Bush said, the media just portrayed it that it was dumb. It really wasn't that bad. But when he referred to the death cult of Islam as the religion of peace, when those words came out of his mouth, that was one of the stupidest things he ever said. It's crap. You know it. I know it. It's not true. But uh, so here we are in way into the global war on terror, not not the global war on Islamo fascism, which is what it really should be. And any country that supports any group or organization that supports Islamo fascism, we should be at war with them and we should declare that war with them, not hide behind this. Oh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna attack a word, terrorism. That's like racism. We're gonna attack racism. Well, how about you? Sh- shouldn't you be dealing with the humans that are involved in that? Warrr. My point is this: there's no reason when Fort Hood Part One went down for our soldiers to have been completely and totally disarmed, other than the fact that the United States Army and the Department of Defense are being run by a bunch of weak, spineless ninnies who are more afraid of offending our enemy than they are of having their own troops murdered. What did Fort Hood Part 1 do? It exposed the United States military, not just to the American people, but to the entire world as a paper tiger. Oh, go ahead and get your panties all wadded up and write me stupid letters about how the United States military is not a paper tiger. We're the greatest fighting force on the planet of the earth. Yeah, we are when we're allowed to do our jobs. The United States military was the greatest fighting force on earth when I was in the Marine Corps. Not because I was in the Marine Corps. That was just an added bonus. Today, In 2015, 2014, 13, 12, what have you, we are not 
And it's not because the men and women don't want to do the job. It's because they're not allowed to do the job. Because you and your neighbors and friends and relatives were so afraid of being referred to as a racist that you allowed a communist community organizer to get elected to the highest office in this nation. Because you're afraid. And he brought in his ilk, all of his minions, and he had put them in charge of the Department of Defense and Education and Homeland Security at all. They're all just little mini berries. Every person that he appoints, they know the script. They know what to do and what to say. When you allow a communist community organizer to nominate the head of the Department of Defense, what do you think you're going to get from that? So what you have and what was exposed to the entire world was that, hey, within their own borders, within the borders of the United States of America, every dude you see in uniform, if they're in a military uniform, you are guaranteed that that person is unarmed. Not I think or maybe. No, you're guaranteed. Because they are forbidden by their own government to be armed. Think about that for a second. Since 9-11, since, since the, we referred to as the men and women in uniform as our heroes... And we say that all the time, our, our heroes in uniform, and we, fl- and we wave flags, and we, we talk about that. Our heroes in uniform who are so inept, who are so untrustworthy, that the United States Army has forbidden them to possess arms. I talked about when I was working for the U.S. Navy, doing the, I'm working for a school called Expeditionary Combat Skills. I mean, that seems pretty hardcore. That's pretty testosterone-laden, right? I mean, expeditionary combat skills. Did you see the news with the Mississippi National Guard recruiting offices? No. They reopened, and they are armed. Really? Yep. No way. Yep. Put that in the show notes right now. Okay. That just happened. Yeah, well, yesterday, the 27th. yesterday on the 27th. I just saw the story on WLOX, though. Rock on. Thank the Lord somebody's got some sense. But Fort Hood Part 1 exposed the United States military as the paper tiger that it is within the borders of the United States of America. And even outside of the borders. The only people that are really doing anything effective are special ops. Our conventional military troops overseas... When you have the U.S. Navy calling itself a global force for good, and they have commercials about, right now, a school is being built in Africa, and a well is being dug. It's like, you're not there to build schools and dig wells. The United States military is there to kill people and break things. It's not the Peace Corps. You want to build schools? Great. Building schools is fun. Digging wells is fun. Digging wells and building schools and handing out lunch boxes is not the job of the United States military. If they're building schools, digging wells, and handing out lunches, they're not doing their jobs. Are you telling me that the enemies of the United States are gone, that they no longer exist? Uh, We're being told that we just can't kill ISIS. The commander-in-chief... And I say that with a little bit of bile in my throat. Goes on television and try and tells us that you can't you can't just you know use guns and bullets to to, to defeat an ideology. The hell you can't. How do we defeat Nazism? How do we defeat fascism in Italy and fascism in Europe? How do we defeat Imperial Japan imperialism with guns and bombs and bullets? And we made him stop. But when uh, ISIS crops up, we're being told, "Well, we can't just we can't just go to where their camps are, you know, and, and kill them and bomb them and stuff." Why? Uh, 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 uh. So when people sp- pop up and I self-identify as the 
uh, enemies of the United States. It's not like they're like we're like sitting around talking with ISIS at the at the Geneva Hotel, you know, some hotel in Geneva. We're like, well, what are you? What are you guys? What are your goals? You know, what do you what do you think about the United? No, they hate the United States. They're murdering people. They're butchering people. They've told us they get in front of Skype for the the love of Pete. Mm-hmm. They go on Skype and tell us that they're going to send their people to America to kill our citizens. And what do we do? What does Barry do? Nothing. Oh, uh, we just, you're in, we're, we just can't, can't you know, use guns and bombs to defeat an ideology. What? And here's the second thing that Fort Hood Part One did. When your commander in chief. Our dear leader, Comrade Barry, goes on television and tells the American public that it's an act, uh, an isolated incident, and it's an act of workplace violence that is in no way related to the religion of peace and brotherhood. You know he wasn't saying that to you, right, audience members, people who are listening to my voice. Comrade Barry wasn't speaking to you. He was speaking to his minions. He was speaking to the goat rapists. He was speaking to those who would kill you. Those who would kill your neighbors and friends and sons and daughters who are in the military. What he was saying was this. I've got your back. If these American peasants decide to get all up in arms and talk about not allowing, you know, death cult members to come into America and how we need to watch these death cult members. And if anybody in law enforcement starts specifically singling out members of the death cult, I've got your back. We will make excuses for you. Each and every time you slaughter our citizens, I will get in front of a television camera and I will send my minions in the media out and we will make excuses for you. So get it done. And guess what? Since Fort Hood Part 1, they've been getting it done because we learned nothing. Big Army Department of Defense learned nothing. Thing. Hell, the army played the gun control game. Oh, we need to make sure that 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 uh, we don't allow our soldiers to have guns on base, and we need to know which soldiers actually are bought guns. And they act- even went so far as to start telling them that they couldn't keep them in their own homes. Now that crap didn't fly for very long. Rather than address the actual problem, and. As far as I know, to date, the Army has not admitted their their culpability in the Nadal Hassan case. No one has come out and said, you know what? Yeah, we way screwed up. Because all the generals that are left in the Army are puppets. Sorry, hurt your feelings? Suck it. They're all politicians and yes-men. Because every time someone comes out... And actually supports the Constitution, supports the troops, openly, openly defies the communist dictator, they're spanked and sent away. And so that teaches the other ones, you better just close your mouth. You want to keep your really cool general uh, salary? You want to keep your pension? You want to have your, you know, career enhancement? You better go along with what the state says. And so what do we have? We have... This uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee murder and the big army and Department of Defense, rather than saying, all right, enough of this crap, open up the armories and everybody gets guns. Oh, we can't do that. We need to to pull down the blinds. Maybe uh, our recruiters shouldn't wear their uniforms. In one town, bless their hearts, bless their hearts for trying in one town in Missis- in Tennessee, the local police department went and filled sandbags, took them to the recruiting center, and they loaded them up and stacked them in the recruiting center. Now, keep in mind that the recruiters and the Army and the military personnel are still forbidden by edict to possess arms. 
but at least they have sandbags. Brothers and sisters, I spent a lot of time in and around sandbag bunkers. And every time I was in and around a sandbag fortification, I was armed. Yeah. You know, somebody really near and dear to my heart wrote a uh, an article about defense and the failed strategy of defense. Remember that, Jared? About how people think that you can just have a great defense and that's going to protect you. You recall that or you were just reading over there? I, uh, yeah. I the failed that. strategy of defense. Does that sound familiar Somebody to you? Somebody that I know wrote one Somebody of near and dear to your heart. All right, let's go ahead and you want to play the audio from WLOX here? Uh, play the audio from WLOX? Yeah, in, in this story, the uh, WLOX.com, and that's our local news affiliate. Mississippi National Guard recruiting offices reopen well, I wanna, I wanna with start, armed recruiters. I want to start with this. I'll start with that. And okay. I'll open up with the... Let me get the audio ready. So you go ahead and say what you need to would say. Would you like me to continue talking to our friends? I would like you to do that. All right. Well, Jared's going to pull the audio from this story because I didn't even know it existed. It just happened. We just got it. And we think that it's fantastic. And thank the Lord someone. And you know what's going to be our salvation if we have salvation in America? What's that, Paul? You need your governor to have some cojones. Did you know that every day is a fun day at Allen Hyundai? I heard that. Okay. But... Uh, you need you want to save America and save the Republic. You need to have a governor that has some huevos, that have some cojones. Because uh, if you don't, your goose is cooked. If you're in New York, your goose is cooked. Things are a little different. And that's because recruiters are now carrying an extra piece of equipment. Jonathan Brannon has the story. We're kind of having a grand reopening. After being closed for about a week, National Guardsmen have resumed their posts at recruitment centers across the state. We took a step back after the incident in Chattanooga and and looked at what our security looked like. That security assessment led to the decision by Governor Phil Bryant. The order now allows Guardsmen to be equipped with a firearm while on the job. According to Lieutenant Colonel Rodney Harris, the holster guns will serve multiple purposes. The purpose that we hope it serves is that it serves as a deterrent to an individual uh, that, that may have their mind set to do something that tampers with our security measures. But if an individual is not deterred by the sight of the weapon, that's when the second purpose kicks in. Of course, we are armed forces, so uh, we're accustomed to being in a position by which uh, we have the opportunity to return fire. Harris says that the addition of the guns isn't the only security measure that will be changing at the 10 offices statewide. He says there may be some other adjustments as well to the storefront glass, visibility, and general access. Veterans like Chris Overfield are happy to see the offices open back up so quickly. I think we need to show people we're not scared to go about our daily lives. He says reopening these offices does just that by showing our enemies that we're still carrying on fighting for the freedoms that we stand for. Jonathan Brannon, WLOX News. The guardsmen were specially trained sometime this past week to ready themselves for this new responsibility. (laughs) They're specially trained? Aren't they in the Army? What kind of training is that? Army training, sir! I'm sorry, that's the best Bill Murray I could do right now. But, uh... Am I to understand that you got that you all? What did he say? You men completed your training yourself. <laughs> I, I love that. I love how the news is just. Some of the news people are just aghast. They're like, "Well, you guys did get special training, right?" Yeah, we're in the freaking army. You remember the old days when the army used to know how to shoot guns and carry guns. They had loaded guns. They still do live fire and basic training. Because uh, I know some of the branches don't. At the uh, Coast Guard, we got a friend who went to the Coast Guard, was in the Coast Guard two and a half years. He and still hadn't, hadn't fired one single live piece of the, ammunition. When he trained with us at Student of the Gun University, it was the first time he'd ever shot a an AR-15 rifle. A real gun. Oh, they have the laser simulators. Not the same thing. This is what they tell these kids. Except not. They tell these kids at Coast Guard Basic when they go through the simulator training with the little lasers and stuff, that it's the same thing. 
Yeah, it's the same thing. Now, oh, I don't, I don't even know how I talked about that. Did you see one of our fans went and bought the uh, the black Princess Leia, Slave Leia? No. Oh, dude, one of our fans just dropped this in there like it's hot. If you guys missed last week's uh, bonus hour, you, you missed a really fun talk. <laughs> where did where did they drop that? Uh, it's it's in the uh, the grad the special grad program. Nah, members. So, that's yeah. awesome. I gotta go look. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, the 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 Princess Leia in her in her uh, Jabba the Hutt's barge slave outfit. You gotta check that stuff out. Oh, dude, that's that's uh, uh, Johnny Red from Johnny Red. He's from Canada. Hey, he's from Canada. Eh? I wonder if was he the one that sent us the magazine. Uh, no, that was Travis. Oh, okay. Travis, thanks if you're listening, and thanks for the magazine. We took pictures of it with all our guns, and we hope you guys saw that. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, that's all the you know. That's all we've got for you right now, dude. I tell you what, we we put a picture up of the, uh, the our local National Guard office recruiters office in Diaberville uh, with the uh, the. It's not an AMRAP, but it's an, an armored fighting vehicle. Basically, yeah. I think they call it an ASV, an armored security vehicle, or something silly like that. Back in the old days, we used to call them LAVs. Whatever, it's a freaking armored vehicle. Um, we put that picture up, and people are all like, "All oh, they're all like pooping themselves." They're like, "I ah, doesn't it's like, dudes, 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 calm down." Mushroom cloud, deep breaths. Yeah, breathe it in, breathe it out. But that office is actually only about what five miles from where mm-hmm. we are right now. Yeah. I'm thinking of going over there and giving those dudes like pizza or something. Or, or dude, we got to do something. Yeah, we should. What do we got? All right, here's what we're gonna do. F this. We're we're going to get some student of the gun swag. And we're going to go over there, and we're just going to, like, give, give it, it to them. Yeah. Sounds H- good. How does that sound? All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, and aliens who are listening to me, tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to talk Don't about... Don't forget the NSA. We're going to... Uh, NSA eats puppies. Maybe I should tag them on social you know media. You know that. Do they have social media? Uh, I don't know. You know the NSA eats include, puppies. I should say featuring NSA every and, single time. And they club baby seals. Yeah. But uh, tomorrow we're going to go uh, down under, eh? We're going to go down to, to Australia. So puck up your ears. Uh, we're going to talk about Alabama. we got some good news coming out of Alabama. How come you didn't do an Alabama accent? Uh, I don't know. Good day. So make sure that you don't miss tomorrow's show. That is That actually is the moral of the story. And we will be back mañana. Remember, you're being there once. Student for life. <laughs>